Uh, okay, so welcome uh, to our next candidate, school board candidate, uh, Jason Feldman. And uh, Jason, thanks for joining us. And um, why don't you tell us a little bit about your, uh, how you came to run for this race? Thank you. Thank you all for having me. And thank you for considering endorsing me for this very important position. <clears throat> um, I'm a father of two uh, elementary school daughters who are in the district. I'm also a uh, civil rights attorney for over 20 years. Um, I've been, I made a career fighting for the underdog. As a deputy district attorney, I was mainly involved in domestic violence cases, working in the community on a federal grant, helping out domestic violence victims. As a defense attorney, I've worked on police corruption cases. I've, uh, I've accepted appointments of indigent, um, of, of indigent defendants facing criminal activity. I've filed cases based on, <clears throat> excuse me, um, based on uh, inadequate medical care for prisoners and uh, excessive force by police. And the, the, the point being is that, uh, uh, you know, I've always fought for the underdog and that's what I want to do on the school board is fight for my children and all children and, and, and all families. I was approached by um, several parents uh, wanting me to run who were very confused about how we got to where we're at with the budget crisis and just really don't feel any input or communication with, with the board. They feel like a lot of the decisions are being made in closed door sessions. They come out, a lot of comments are made. There's just a, a thank you and a nod and then they go in these votes and people just don't understand what's happening with our board and how we got to this um, very difficult crossroads in where we're at with the budget crisis, you know, of course with, with COVID-19 and um, people are very concerned, and that's what I'm, I'm, I'm in this race to do, to give uh, a voice to those that, that, that aren't being heard. Thank you. So um, I was very interested, I mean, you mentioned it now, but your, your uh, uh, questionnaire response goes really deep into the, the issue, I think the main issue that, that you're running on is the, the lack of transparency and accountability with the current board. So can you just basically describe um, your experience of some of the big issues of transparency that you've experienced that the board is currently responsible for? Right, and I, you know, and I, I can't underestimate, uh, underemphasize this enough. I mean, almost every parent I talk to, uh, they're, they're just really confused about how decisions are made and what's happening. And uh, you know, if, if any of you have uh, participated in the meetings, um, you know, and it's, it's a difficult task for, for, for the board, number one, in the job that they do, and also in, in making people feel like they're included, because, you know, and even more so with, um, with COVID-19, because it's all on Zoom, and there's very little personal contact going on. But um, what's, what's happening is, um, you, you know, there's, you know, there's, there's the Brown Act, there's all these requirements of, of, of transparency, there's, which creates a certain expectation but in, in practice, it's very difficult. And, uh, you know, people sign up for, for comments. There are a lot of really informed parents out there and they make these comments and, and perhaps it's just the way these meetings are set up, but um, there's a lot of, of yes, thank you and on to the next. And um, there's, it just seems like the board is a real closed group and they're, they're making decisions on themselves. And a lot of these votes seem predetermined um, even before they get together, people are saying, oh, I know how they're going to vote on this. And, and there's just not a lot of discussion. There's not a lot of debate. There's not a lot of input. Got it. Um, so uh, uh, I'm wondering um, if you can describe uh, like how, how you would, what kind of transparency strategies that you would have as a board member to rectify the problem yeah and there's there's it, it's a twofold thing i mean there's the reality of it and then there's the perception of it and to to the extent that the board is being transparent they're losing it in the perception game because it, it's it's not getting through to the to, to the general public and there's certain amount of discussions um i believe the board is unable to have be, be, because everything has to be out in in, in the public but I think it's about staying in good communication with everybody. Maybe it's through, maybe it's better communication with the committees. And I know the board members work very hard to do that. They go to all these extra meetings and so forth, but it, it's, it, it's just not getting through. It's, it's about more conversation, more real input. Um, 
you, you know, a allow things to be decided actually at the meetings um, as opposed to having this all decided. I know they have to get through these meetings. There there's one of the meetings that went on for over five hours. You know, it it it's not like there's not an effort to be inclusive, but it's it's just not getting through. So the, the reality of it, we have the board has to actually accept the input and then they have to communicate to the people in some way how that input was 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 received and utilized. Great. And um, I think that you may have skipped or missed one of the questions on the questionnaire. So I just wanted to follow up with you about campus surveillance. What's your position on on surveillance? Yeah, I, I'm. I'm very wary of, uh, you know, like have, like in my high school, they had un undercover cops there trying to do drug busts. I, I didn't appreciate it then. I don't like it now. Um, and surveillance, I, I know, is, is a separate question. Um, you, you know, when you're talking about kids and there are, there are enough parents that are freaked out about their kids' privacy to begin with in, involving data, but to actually be filming these kids around campus is... is I would I would exercise a lot of caution. You want eyes on the campus. You want the public spaces to be viewed, it, it, especially in high schools. You want to be able to go back and and view a video if if something if something bad goes down. You don't want it in private spots. You don't want a Big Brother feel on these campuses because it doesn't uh, it it just doesn't um, it's not consistent with with free thinking and free free education. So I, I would say I fall on the anti category, but at the same time, schools have to be secure and, um, and we have to be able to come up with an answer to what happened in certain things around campus. Does that, does that answer the question a little bit? Yeah, thank you. And uh, let's go to Peter next. Hi, Jason. Um, I'm curious as to what is your perception? You mentioned a budget crisis in your opening. And I'm wondering what, in your mind, is this crisis? How did we get here? And what, what might be the solution? Right, well, it's, it, it's a complicated question and, and a complicated answer. I mean, you know, you look at our district and it's so resource rich. Um, you know, there are some very, very valuable houses in our district, some of the most valuable housing areas, you know, the property taxes, of course, go, go into school budgets. Um, you know, it, it, it looks like there, there were a couple of, couple of main things that converged on, on, on the budget. Um, you know, there was a budget shortfall. There has been a couple million, my understanding, for a little while, but one or two years ago, we became a basic aid district. Um, our property, uh, property taxes hit a certain amount and we lost over $8 million a year from the, the county or the state. Um, and so all of a sudden it's a crisis. Um, you know, my only issue is how, how is this a surprise, and uh, and and now what what are we going to do about it moving forward? It's it's not you know I'm not it's not about putting blame on what happened, but now 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 what do we do? Um, and it's you know, another thing that's happened. It looks like there's been a lot of cost involving our lawsuits and you know paying lawyers. There are various reasons why the district gets sued, and you're never going to end them. But it's just been so expensive, and it's become this focus. And it seems like you know if we can. If, you know, and this is something I really think I can I can add to the board, and it'll probably you know, and it's not just a board issue; it, it involves the city attorney and, and a lot of other uh, uh, stakeholders. But you know, we we got to we got to preempt a lot of these lawsuits. You know, there there was one class action that I saw happen in San Diego, and then happened in another district, and 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 then it came here. And it's like you know, we we've got to be monitoring these things. We got to you know anticipate if we need to make a change to head off these lawsuits. You know, there's a city claim process and uh, very few cases I know from experience are, are dealt with at the city claim phase, but this is before you need to hire lawyers. And this is, and, and sometimes you can, you can if you know something's going to be resolved, you can resolve it earlier and, and cheaper. And also mediation is another way to do that. Um, so I think I can add a lot to the lawsuits and, and regarding the rest, I mean, we need to, I, I would like it to be reprioritized. Um, you know, teachers over consultants, and we need to find some new funding sources. Um, we need to get back to er early education, things that might cost money, but, but end up being cost effective in the long run and, and make for a much better school system. Are you in, in you. favor of the building projects that have gone on, the expansion of the high school and the uh, new auditorium at, at uh, John Adams? Uh, generally, yes. Um, there, you know, it, it's my understanding too, that a lot of the budget for those building projects are coming from a particular bond project. 
you know, so, so when, when you're on the, you know, when you're on the outside looking in, um, like I got, I got 10 emails yesterday because people found out that a consultant was paid $5,000 to, to, to speak at something. And it, it, and that, that might be outrageous, but also sometimes these things come from a federal grant or sometimes these things come from a particular bond measure. So um, I think everything needs to be looked at in terms of cost effectiveness. Um, I think, you know, we need to improve facilities, new facilities. I'm, I'm all for modernization. Um, and if it's coming from a, a, a defined funding source, then, then that sounds good to me. It sounds like that's part of your transparency issue too. That if it was stated that, you know, that this specialist was being paid out of X grant or whatever, it would have alleviated a lot of email pounding. Yes, yes, I agree. Thanks, Peter, and uh, let's go to Dami now. Hi, Peter, how are you doing? I'm Ed. Um, uh, I'd like to ask um, about your background in the school itself. Um, because it's you listed on being on the um, John Muir PTA and full disclosure, my wife used to be the president of the PTA, and I'd like to hear about your kids there and your experiences in the school. Like, like what you know, what have you been doing in each of the schools? Um, just to get a sense, since you're running for the school board, and we like to you know talk to people that really have experience with kids in the school system. Right. Um, yeah. So one of my daughters attends John Muir, and the other daughter attends Franklin. Uh, and, um, you know, I'm a member of the P, uh, of the PTAs. I, I haven't been a president. I haven't been an office holder. Um, I've gone to a ton of events and, you know, obviously and donated and so forth, but I haven't been, um, in leadership positions on the PTA or, or, or in the schools. I have been, you know, an actively involved parent. Um, one of my daughters is, is, uh, is, is, is special needs, um, which has required um, a lot of meetings and a lot of, um, you know, discussions about getting services. And I've learned a lot of the ins and outs that way. But, um, but I haven't been, and I'm not going to represent myself as someone that's been running the schools or in leadership positions in these organizations. So, okay. A follow up on that though, like what qualifies you to make that leap to school board from being PTA member instead of making your way up and possibly leading one of the PTAs? Well, I, I think that's for you all to decide, and I think that's for... for, for um, no, no, that's actually for... Yes. I would like to hear from you, like, why, you know, because it's, it's a hierarchical, I mean, like, experience. That's important. I want to hear from you. Yes. Um, well, I, I, I think I bring a, um, a, a knowledge and, and a sensibility, and, and, and as a parent, um, I haven't been intimately involved in the, the workings of the, uh, of, the, of the district, but I think my training as an attorney... I that's, think that's, uh, yeah, that's, yeah. yeah uh, um, I, I think can, can can really help. I mean, I don't I don't think we need a school board of of, of all attorneys, but I think I, I think it's helpful to have to have some. Um, I think uh, and I think as a parent um, with with and I, I may I maybe there, there there might be one other person running that has kids that are actually in 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 the district, um, but I'm really coming at it from from uh, someone with with a particular skill set. And, and, and training that uh, ha has a real stake in, in terms of my, my children and, uh, and wanting to help out all, all children and all families. Thank you. Okay. Great, let's go, to, uh, let's go to Ed. Hi, Jason. <clears throat> Hi there. Um, is there a vote that you can think of that the, board, that the board has taken or a policy stance that they've taken in the past where you would have voted differently? Um, yes, there, there, there are several. One, one in particular, I'm, I'm kind of baffled by, and I know there's always, you know, there's, there's always some reasons for these, but the, the, the decimation of the Head Start program is a real head scratcher for, 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 for me. I mean, it's, it's, you know, I think it's been proven study after study how important it is. Um, to to uh, early education, especially if you're if you're serious about closing the the achievement gap, um, you, you know people come people come into to kindergarten at, at, at certain levels, and you you can level that playing field a lot, and that time period is so important. So I I, I would say uh, you know that vote in particular, and it it seemed like it seemed like there was a plan 
like we're not going to we're not going to go for this grant we're going to have another plan but it really didn't seem like that the, the, the substitute plan for head start really came into fruition or or turned out to be the the way they wanted but um i i would i would definitely want to emphasize or, or early education for you, uh, so you would have voted for more more support for head start than you thought the board came up with yes okay good thanks okay let's go to patricia Uh, yeah, I, I was going to ask you the question that Dami already asked you, so you, and you answered quite thoroughly. But um, Ed's point about Head Start, yesterday you said the same thing about decimation of the Head Start program, and the board member who was listening took offense of that. But in fact, it was decimated. It was gone. It was eliminated. However, every single student was placed and is getting subsidized um, early childhood education. No children were lost in the decimation of the Head Start program. And when you said that they, they were going to create a plan, have you, have you looked into what it was that they created? Because um, it's been, it, it, you know, it's been successful. Right, I, I, I believe, it, and I have, I have looked into it. I, I believe it's a matter of dispute how, how, how successful it's been. I've, I've heard that there were, there was at least the intention to provide for all those students. I, I've heard mixed things about that. I heard that there were, uh, you know, around 60 kids that were not, that, that were not accounted for in it. And I think, um, you know, if, uh, if, if, it's, if it's asserted that there's been no damage done, and that uh, uh, we, we have a system in place that is at least as good. Um, one, I'd want to, you know, they didn't apply for the, for the federal grant. I'd want to, I, I think we need to take an assessment of that. And I think also we, you know, we need to follow the money a little bit. If we didn't apply for that grant, is this being paid for elsewhere? Or was this privatized in, in, in another way? Did this, um, because there's, there's a, a lot of movement and, and it's hard, you know, all these things cost a lot of money, but the more we bring in companies to run our public education, the less our education system is public. Um, it, yeah. It's by privatization. And the Head Start program, one thing that's so wonderful about it is that it is a public. And it seems to me like there was a substitute of a private. And it seems to me that some kids were, were uh, sacrificed or had to be re, 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 reshuffled in that. But I, I think we need to do an assessment of that because it was a big change. And um, it didn't seem to go exactly as planned to me. And I'm so, and I, you know, if uh, if I offended anyone, uh, I apologize. <laughs> but and, and and then the federal grant was going to require ho home visits and home education for uh, that would that would be prohibitively expensive. There were there were reasons for it, and I agree with you. We should do an assessment, and we should see if there were children lost. So thank you for, for the more complete answer on that. Thank you for your question. Uh, thanks, and we're, we're running low on time, but I wanted to ask you your assessment of um, Malibu's attempt to unify and um, how you think uh, we should react to that now um, based on where you stand. Right, and this is not, right, this is not a, a new question. And you know, when I hear about when I hear about them splitting off, you know, my initial reaction is, you know, we, we should come together stronger. You know, this was voted on by the board in 2017, I, I believe. And, you know, the reasons why they, uh, they, they rejected it uh, was number one, it was gonna hurt Santa Monica financially. And number two, um, th there was a belief that Malibu didn't have enough students. And I think uh, to, to, to sustain their own uh, uh, district. And to me, th those two issues have only been exacerbated. They're only, they're only worse. Number one, now we're in, since 2017, we're in a, a serious uh, deficit crisis. Uh, so it, and any harm to us financially would, would be more extreme. And Malibu last year had to deal with all those fires. And I, you know, I, I think they, they, need, they need our help, it seems like at this point, to, to rebuild and rebuild stronger. And I think that's an opportunity for Santa Monica and Malibu to, to, to come together in, in, in a stronger way. I would be looking to, to uh, uh, you know, a, a better union as opposed to, um, you, you know, splitting off. Great, well, uh, there's a couple more questions, but we really are out of time. So uh, we'll, we'll have to save them for 
our forum. But thank you so much, Jason. Really appreciate uh, you coming in. Thank you, guys. You have a wonderful organization, and I, I appreciate you considering me. Thanks a lot.